Good morning, Park Plaza family. It's great to be with you today. As you are getting your day started up, the 40 that are with me in Israel at this very moment, because of the time change, our first day of the week, Sunday, is actually coming to a close. I appreciate so very much Jeff Riddle, Gary Miner, those that work in our sound booth over at Jinx and also at the Brookside campus for the work they do that enables uh, me to come to you on video whenever need be. We're still moving through our new sermon series, our lessons titled, Getting Through What You're Going Through. We began two weeks ago with an introduction on the six stages of mourning and how God moves us through that, the biblical plan of spiritual growth when tough times come our way. This past week we talked about the first stage, shock. Wrapping our mind around that initial stage of mourning and grief. When the policeman comes to your door late at night and he's got bad news about a friend that's been in an accident. When that simple procedure on a loved one, well, the doctor calls you over and things didn't go as planned. The despair, being disillusioned, all of those things set in in an initial stage of shock. When our springs turn to winter, our blue skies to gray, when the shadow of despair and even death falls upon us, we're in shock. We then move out of that stage into a deep time of sorrow. Sometimes there are difficulties that are not all that deep in the valleys they bring us to. But nevertheless, even though the times may not be deep, there are things that we do mourn. There are things that we lose in this life where we experience grief. It is in times like these that our Lord Jesus, that His words speak to us in a very profound way. Read with me now, if you will, in Luke chapter 4, beginning in verse 14. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about Him spread through the whole countryside. He taught in their synagogues, and everyone praised Him. He went to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day went to the synagogue, as was his custom. And he stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it was written, and he began to read. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has appointed me and anointed me to lift and heal the brokenhearted. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus brings about a new way to move forward. Our mourning takes on a meaning. Our pain and our problems, we begin to encounter a path in which God is actually doing something not just in spite of our troubles, but in the midst of our troubles, in us and through us. Our pain will never be replaced, but with God it is transmuted. It's not just done away with. It's not swept under the rug. It's not thrown out the door. That very pain is changed into something that brings about a ministry of the Spirit in us, and then through us. And anyone involved in the ministry of God experiences the joy of working with God, and we begin to understand that pain in God's hand is transformed and transmuted into joy. When we're in shock and sorrow, that seems unbelievable, but that's the biblical record. That's the testimony of those who have gone before. You know, as I watch our kids today, they, they get a kick out of watching cartoon characters like we did growing up. SpongeBob SquarePants and his, his rabble, other cartoon characters. Back in my day, it was more Scooby-Doo and individuals like that. And one that I really enjoyed was Charlie Brown. Charlie Brown and the Peanuts gang, they were ones that, well, they were always up to something. Snoopy was the star of the show with Woodstock and all that group. But Charlie Brown, as you can see in this shot, he was one who really knew how to have sorrow. 
He was one who knew how to cry out, whether he was trying to kick that football that Lucy kept jerking away from him. He was one that also was known for a phrase more than any other, good grief. You know, we hear that every once in a while. And today I want to ask the question as we're talking about this second stage of mourning. Is there such a thing as good grief? Is there such a thing when God is involved of not just good sorrow, but godly sorrow? If you've got your handouts with you today on the back, you'll find a sermon outline. Our first point this morning is this. Grief is healthy. When you involve God and your grief meets the grace of Jesus Christ, grief is not just something that you can be okay with, grief is healthy. In fact, it's the only healthy response to loss. When we stuff it, when we sweep it under the rug, when we deny it, oh, we can do that, but there's going to be a hefty price to pay. There's a word that's falling into a little bit of disuse today. It's the word bereavement. Bereavement comes from the word reave. The definition to reave is to forcibly be robbed, to be one who has been plundered, to be one who has had something taken away from them by force. When you are bereaved, you have been reaved, you have been robbed. And that's what the Bible says about times of mourning. We're people who understand that this world is broken. Governments are broken. Economies are broken. Our bodies are broken. The record of Genesis talks about this. The entire Bible does. As a result, death robs. Divorce robs. Relationships. Painful relationships come into play, and things as they are are not as they should be, nor as we had planned. And things in the future are also times where we've been plundered, we've been robbed, and therefore we bereave. So when you've been bereaved, when you're in a time of sorrow, when you're in a time of mourning, how does in any way that become good? Let me ask you a question this morning. Would you agree that Jesus never, ever committed a sin? Let me go a little bit farther with that. Would you agree that Jesus never did anything that was spiritually, socially unhealthy in any way? You you know that answer. He was perfect in every way. And so Jesus, this perfect one, let's take a look at what he does. When he's robbed of a friendship, when he encounters loss in the death of his good friend Lazarus. If you have your Bibles, please be turning to John chapter 11, verse 33 through 36. If you don't have your Bibles today, they'll look behind me and we've got it on the PowerPoint for you. John 11, 33. When Jesus saw them, when Jesus saw her weeping... And the Jews who had come along with her also weeping. He was deeply moved in spirit and trouble. Where have you laid him? Jesus asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. The Jews said, see how he loved him. Jesus understood that grieving and sorrow and mourning were things that a perfect one could undertake because they were completely biblical. They were ways that are and still are of today of God, and they are healthy. When David receives bad, horrible news on the loss of the king of Israel, Saul, and his son, his best friend, Jonathan, that news played out like this in 2 Samuel 1 and 4. The messenger who brings the news, well, he said... Well, King David, the men fled from the battle. Many of them fell and died, and Saul and his son Jonathan, well, they are also dead. What does David do? It later reads, In lament, David ripped his clothes to ribbons. All the men with him did the same. They wept and fasted the rest of the day, 
grieving the death of Saul and his son Jonathan. But the biblical record, God's word is not done yet. We move forward a few more verses and it reads like this. Then David sang this lament over Saul and his son Jonathan, and then gave orders that everyone in Judah learn it by heart. You see, David was on to something. Grief, number one, is not just healthy, but number two in your sermon outline, grief is healed in community. David understood it was very important for others to bear up under this burden of grief that he was encountering. When God in Genesis created a perfect world, everything was good except one, and that was man alone. You see, there is something very powerful and needed in community. Grief is healed in community. David commanded that others would join them in community. Galatians 6 and 2 says this, Carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of God. Christ. That law which is the greatest law, love your neighbor as yourself, love God and loving your neighbor, the way you fulfill that is carry each other's burdens. Later Paul would say to the Roman church in Romans 12 and 15, do two things. Rejoice with those who rejoice, that's half your life. But the other half is just as important, mourn with those who mourn. Grief being healed in community is about different individuals bringing different perspectives, different gifts, different ways of looking at things. It's about three and a half weeks ago that this went viral across Facebook, our internets, all type of ways in social media. Did you get a load of this? I know you did. Maybe there's a few that don't know where I'm going with this, but let me ask right now. We haven't done this as a body of believers here at Park. This is very important stuff. How many, when you look at this dress, see blue or black? And how many of you see this white and gold color that's a complete apostasy to anything that's true? Okay, so let's take a vote. Blue and black people, raise your hands. All right. Those who see white and gold, raise your hands. Let me get to a third important group. Who doesn't care what color the dress is? Okay, there we go. Now we're all in one of those camps. I don't know if you bring this perspective or that perspective, but there's something, sometimes we need to laugh a little bit in a sermon series that gets into waters this deep. And the truth is this, that we look at things differently. It's the same thing, but we see it differently. And so when it comes to grief and community and, well, I don't offer what they offer and I haven't been counseled or trained like them, sometimes it's not bringing a word at all or being trained at all. It's the ministry of presence and just being there. And we come in community and God works in that. Number three this morning is this, grief is a blessing. How would you like this morning to be blessed by God? How would you like this morning to have the supreme power of the universe that you could know he's made a promise that you can live and act in a way where he wants to pour blessings into your life? Again, this morning we turn to the words of Jesus and they speak to us. In Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him and he began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Many know that sermon better than any other sermon that Jesus ever preached. Sermon on the Mount, beginning with the Beatitudes. We understand there that Jesus says, Blessed are those who are poor in spirit. Blessed are those of God who mourn, for they will be comforted. There's something very powerful in what God is doing in bringing blessings to our life through grief. No wonder Psalms 34 and 18 reads this way. The Lord, talking about blessings... 
The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. And though we find blessings in grief, though we're healed in community in the midst of our grief, though we understand grief and mourning and sorrow are healthy, our, for, our fourth point is the most important this morning, church. Grief is a choice. You have to choose to grieve. You must choose to let grief do its work. Here's one I want you to leave with today. You can't hurry your hurt. We're a quick people. We want to move on. We want to be John Wayne and stuff it and deny it and get on with it. We have to choose to let grief do its work, and we can't hurry our hurts. Grief is one of God's keys to spiritual growth. Never miss a good hurt. If you're going to be there, get out of it all that God wants you to get out of it. And get through what you're going through like God has ordained that you move through that. Loss of a friend, loss of a spouse, loss of health, job. He asked me to marry him, but then now it's off. Loss of an engagement. To the soldier or someone else, loss of a limb, loss of a pregnancy. How can we choose to be in that grief? Better yet, in closing out our lesson today, let me ask you, how do we grieve? How are we people that allow this key to God's spiritual growth fully to take hold in our lives? Three points, number one, choose to be honest. Jeremiah 6.14 lays out a principle. You can't heal a hurt by pretending it's not there. We have to understand that we are not the only ones who are wounded in our relationship with God. Let me play that out to you via this email I received the other day. In his book, If I Were God, I Would End All Pain by John Dickinson. He tells a story about speaking on the theme of the wounds of God at a university campus here in America. After his presentation, the audience was allowed to ask questions. Rather quickly, a man in his mid-30s, who was a Muslim leader at the university, stood up and expressed how preposterous the idea was that the great God of the universe would have any wounds on him. He referred to God as the creator of causes and that a lesser entity could not possibly cause God any pain. In that man's estimation, what Dickinson spoke was blasphemy of the highest order according to the Koran. God having wounds. Dickinson later wrote, I had no knockdown argument, no witty comeback. The debate was much, more, was much too amicable for either approach anyway in that audience. In the end, I simply thanked him in front of the audience for demonstrating and for everyone who was in attendance the radical contrast between the Islamic conception of God and what is described in the Bible. What the Muslim community and religion denounces as blasphemy, the Christian holds as precious. Our God has wounds. We've got to be honest. If we say we don't have wounds, we are now conversing and praying with one who does. Something's out of line. It is only honest to come before a wounded God who has taken upon himself our infirmities. The only sign of sin that will be in heaven will be the scars on Jesus' hands and feet. As we encounter this honest God, let us also be honest and now in that honesty begin to ask God to heal our wounds. Speaking of another cartoon character this morning, not SpongeBob, not Charlie Brown, I get a kick every time I read Psalm 88. You'll have to go look it up. The the author is He-Man. You remember He-Man? I don't, I don't think it's the He-Man you remember, but nevertheless, his name is He-Man the Ezraite. Psalm 88 is the darkest, 
gloomiest piece of Scripture in the entire Bible. One of your assignments is to look at that this week and see how God puts that in His Word. And in so doing for us, puts forward this plea and cry to be honest before Him. The second thing we've got to choose to do in grieving is not only be honest, but to be fearless. There are many who say, I don't want to dig up all my past sorrows and days of mourning. I don't want to spend any more time. In fact, I never spend any time there anyway. Why go there now? I'm past it. There's a word for that. It's called fear. We're afraid that if we dig up those old emotions that they'll overwhelm us. The truth is, is if we are not honest with them and we are not fearless in dealing with them, we will be overwhelmed. We'll be like a dam that never lets any water off. The pressure will eventually break us. All good dams that hold back lakes let off the overflow. Can we be people who understand that we're called to be honest, we're called to be fearless? Mitch, if I dig those things up, I might lose my mind. Now, let me tell you how you're going to lose your mind is if you don't deal with those things and you just continue to deny it and stuff it. If you are afraid of going through those valleys, claim Psalm 23. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. I shall fear not. The Bible never tells us. Jesus never hops up on his high horse and says, cry not. He never says, sorrow not. He never says, grieve not. But I find it interesting that 365 times, one time for every day in the year, he tells us, fear not. Grief and dealing with it in a fearless manner does not paralyze. Stuffing it down and the fear itself of dealing with it, that's what paralyzes. And number three, choose to be dependent. There is no help for those who admit no need for help. No repair for those who insist nothing is broken. Let us be people who come to God, the God of Psalm 103, 13, and 14. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we're frail. He remembers that we are dust. Today, choose to be honest, choose to be fearless, and choose to stop being the Lord of all, choose to stop being in God's position, and choose today to remember He is the Father, you are the son or daughter, and He has compassion on you, He knows how you're made, He knows you're frail as dust, and He wants you to lean and be dependent on Him. As the old song goes, God will make a way. When there seems to be no way, He works in ways we cannot see. He will make a way for me. Today, there are elders down front. If in any way today, you want to begin on the path of allowing your sorrow, your pain, your mourning, your grief to be turned into a new way forward in your life, whether you have lost spouse, whether it has been divorce or death, bankruptcy, loss of a friend, loss of a relationship with a family member, it's sideways, it's broken, where do we go from here? I'm grieving what used to be, what's here now and is not supposed to be. God, can you make a way for me when there seems to be no way? Father, would you work in ways that I cannot see? And Father, will you make a way for me? If that is your prayer today, would you come now as we stand and as we sing?